Hi, and welcome to the next video in the PyTorch training series on building models with PyTorch. Specifically in this video, we're going to discuss the module and parameter classes in PyTorch, which encapsulate your machine learning models and learning weights respectively, and how they work together. Common neural network layer types, including linear, convolutional, recurrent, and transformer networks. Other layers and functions, such as batch norming, dropout, and activation functions and loss functions. Model building in PyTorch is centered around two classes in the torch.nn module, the module class and the parameter class. The module class encapsulates models and model components, such as neural network layers. The parameter class is a subclass of torch.tensor that represents learning weights. Modules and parameters work together. When a parameter is assigned as an attribute of a module, the parameter object gets registered with that module. If you register an instance of a module subclass as an attribute of a module, the contained module's parameters are also registered as parameters of the owning class. This might be simpler with an example. Let's have a look at this small model. It has two fully connected neural network layers, an activation function in between them, and a softmax at the end. This model shows the common structure of a PyTorch model. First, note that it's a subclass of torch.nn.module. There's an init method that defines the structure of the model, the layers and functions that make it up. There's also a forward method, which composes those layers and functions into the actual computation. When we create an instance of this model and print it, we see that not only does it know its own layers and the attributes they're assigned to, but also the order in which we register them. When we print out just one of the layers, we get a description of just that layer. Our tiny model and our linear layers are all subclasses of torch.nn.module, so we can access their parameters through the parameters method. Here, we've printed out the learning parameters for the whole model and for only the linear two layer. Note that the tensors making up linear two's parameters are the same as the last parameters of the whole model. The model registers parameters of submodules it owns recursively. This is important because the model has to pass all of these parameters to the optimizer during training. Next, let's take a look at some of the layer types available in PyTorch. PyTorch has classes encapsulating the common layer types used in modern machine learning models. The most basic type is the fully connected or linear layer, which we saw in the example above. This is a layer where every input influences every output, hence calling it fully connected, and that influence is to a degree determined by the layer's weights. If a layer has m inputs and n outputs, it will its weights will be in m by n matrix. As a simple example, here's a tiny linear layer that takes a three element input and yields a two element output. And there's a random three element vector we'll use as input. Passing this input gives us a two element output vector. If you go ahead and do the matrix multiplication of x times the weights, and then you add the two biases, you should get the output y. Also, note that when we print the parameters, it lets us know that they require gradients. That is, that they're tracking computation history so we can comp compute gradients for learning. Parameter is a subclass of torch.tensor, but this default behavior of setting autograd to true is different from what the tensor class does. Linear layers are widely used in deep learning models. One common place you'll see them is at the end of classifier models, where the last layer or last few layers will be linear layers. Convolutional layers are meant to address data that is strongly correlated in space. They're common in computer vision models where they can be used to detect close clusters of interesting features and compose them into larger features or recognized objects. They come up in other contexts too, such as NLP applications. Often, the intent of a word is influenced by the words near it. In an earlier video, we had a look at Lynette 5. Let's take a closer look at how this computation is structured. Lynette 5 is meant to take in black and white 32 by 32 pixel image tiles of handwritten numbers and classify them according to which digit is represented. Looking at the first convolutional layer in the model, we can see his arguments are 1, 6, and 5. 
The first argument is the number of input channels. For us, that's going to be one, because a black and white image only has one channel of data. The second argument, six, is the number of features we want this layer to learn. So it can recognize up to six different arrangements of pixels in the input. And finally, the five is the size of the convolution kernel. You can think of this like a window that gets scanned over the input, collecting features inside this five pixel window. The output of this convolutional layer is an activation map that is a spatial map of where it found certain features. The second convolutional layer is similar. It takes the first layer's in, uh, output as input. So that's why its first argument is six. We recognize six features in the first convnet, and we take those as our six input channels to the next convolutional layer. This layer, we're asking to learn 16 different features, which it makes by composing the features from the first layer. And we're only using a three element window for the convolution kernel. After the second convolution layer has composed its features into a higher level activation map, we pass the output to a set of linear layers that act as a classifier, with the final layer having 10 outputs representing the probabilities that the input represents one of the 10 digits. PyTorch has convolutional neural network layers for one, two, and three dimensional inputs. There are more optional arguments that you can look up in the documentation, such as stride length and padding. The current neural networks are neural networks designed for use with sequential data, such as a string of words in a natural language sentence or a string of real-time measurements from an instrument. An RNN does this by keeping a hidden state. This acts as a sort of memory for what it's seen so far in the sequence. The internal structure of an RNN layer or its variants, the long short-term memory or LSTM and the gated recurrent unit or GRU is pretty complex and outside the scope of this video. But we can show you what it looks like in action with this long short-term memory based part of speech tagger. The constructor has four arguments. It has the size of the input vocabulary, that is the size of the entire inventory of words it's meant to recognize. Each of these words is represented as the index of a one-hot vector in a vocab size dimensional space. The tag set size is the number of tags that you want the model to recognize and output. Embedding dim is the size of the embedding space for the vocabulary. It embedding maps of vocabulary down to a lower dimensional space where words with similar meanings are close together in that space. And hidden dim is the size of the LSTM's memory. The input will be a sentence with words represented as indices of one hot vectors. The embedding layer will map these down to the embedding dim dimensional space. And the LSTM takes the sequence of embeddings and iterates over it, yielding an output vector of length hidden dim. The final linear layer acts as a classifier, applying log softmax to the output, and the final layer converts the output into a normalized set of estimated probabilities that a given word maps to a given part of speech tag. If you'd like to see this network in action, there's a tutorial on it on pytorch.org. Transformers are multipurpose neural networks, but we see them very often these days in natural language uh, applications following the success of BERT, which is a transformer model. Uh, now, a discussion of transformer architecture, which is kind of complex, is outside the scope of this video, but know that PyTorch has a transformer class that allows you to define the overall parameters of a transformer model. That is the number of encoder and decoder layers, the number of attention heads, uh, dropout and activation functions, etc. Uh, you can even, using the PyTorch transformer class, build the BERT model from this single class with the right parameters. PyTorch also has classes to encapsulate the individual components of a transformer, such as the encoder and decoder and the layers that make them up. There are non-learning layer types that perform important functions in models. One example is max pooling and its twin min pooling. These functions reduce a tensor by combining cells together and assigning the maximum value of those input cells to the output cell. This is one of those things that's probably easier explained by example. So if you look closely here, we have a six by six matrix which 
you use max pool to reduce to a 4x4 four four matrix. The 4x4 four four matrix, the four elements of it, each one contains the maximum value of a 3x3 three three quadrant from the input. Normalization layers recenter and normalize the output of one layer before feeding it to another. Centering and scaling intermediate tensors inside your computation has a number of beneficial effects, such as letting you use higher learning rates without problems of uh, vanishing and exploding gradients. Running the cell above, we've added a large scaling factor and an offset to a random input tensor. You should see that the input tensor's mean is somewhere in the neighborhood of 15. After we run it through the normalization layer, you can see that the values are all smaller and grouped around zero. In fact, the mean of this should be very small. Like, now this is good because a lot of activation functions, which we'll discuss in a little bit, uh, have their strongest gradients near zero, but they sometimes suffer from vanishing or exploding gradients for inputs that drive them far away from zero. Keeping the data centered around the area of steepest gradient means that learning will tend to happen faster and converge faster, and higher learning rates will be feasible for your training. Dropout layers are a tool for encouraging sparse representations in your model, that is, pushing it to do inference with less data. Dropout layers work by randomly setting parts of the input tensor to zero during training. Dropout layers are always turned off for in inference. This forces the model to learn how to do inference against masked or reduced de input data. So as an example, If I take a random input tensor and I pass it through a dropout layer twice, you should see that I get the same input tensor back with some random elements uh, set to zero. Dropout layers help a model learn sparse representations by pushing it to do inference with less input data. Dropout weight layers work by randomly setting parts of the input tensor to zero during training. Dropout layers are always turned off for inference. This forces the model to learn against a masked or reduced data set. So as an example, I'll create a random input tensor and pass it through a dropout layer, and I'll do it twice. And you'll see that there are some zeros and there are some values, but the values are always identical. It's randomly setting the zeros uh, throughout the tensor. You can use the optional p argument to set the probability. Here we set it to 40%. Uh, the default is 0.5. The final ingredients we need to build our models are activation functions and loss functions. Activation functions are part of what make deep learning possible. If you recall the linear layer example earlier, it was just a simple matrix multiplication to take an input vector and get an output vector. And if we stack many such layers together, no matter how many layers we do, we can always reduce that to a single matrix multiplication, which means that we can only ever simulate linear equations with our machine learning model. This is where activation functions come in. By inserting a nonlinear activation function between layers, we develop the ability to simulate nonlinear equations. Torch.nn.module offers all the major activation functions, including the rectified linear unit and its many variants, hyperbolic tangent, hard hyperbolic tangent, sigmoid, etc. It includes other functions such as softmax that are most useful at the output stage of a model. PyTorch has a variety of common loss functions, including mean squared error, which is the same as the L2 norm, and cross-entropy loss and negative likelihood loss, which are useful for classifiers, and others.